founder. And the thing about Val Ross is that he tried to he tried to use all his maths knowledge and find a way of modelling the whole economy in general using maths. And and he thought if we could do this, and him and Arrow and De Bruy later on, they stressed this idea of the way that they could model the whole of the economy with maps. And they thought, if we do that, we're onto a win. We've solved economics, basically. And of course, they found out that you can't do that, and they ran into severe problems. So they, so they really got nowhere with that. But they, they, they did a lot of the maps behind the economics. And they, they, were, they weren't, we shouldn't look at them badly, because they tried to do something that was wrong. Samuelson was interesting as well, because he said that there, were loads of use of, like, there was loads of use of maps in physics. And he tried to look at how the maps was used in physics, and tried to see how we could use that in economics as well. Um, and so he, he was quite clever to think that, and uh, physics is mentioned in that article, so I think I'm going back to that article book because I really like it. And one point of part there, obviously these aren't the only um, economists to use maths. Uh, if you look at like Keynes and Marshall and all that, they're using maths as well, yeah. But these are economists who I just wanted to stress who really were, only, were mainly interested in using maths in economics. Um, and obviously there are more who were more focused on economics when their main interest wasn't maths in economics. Uh, now, modern day applications of maths and economics, you've got game theory, that's an obvious example. The maths behind game theory is too hard for me. Um, it's, it's really tough, um, it's the hard stuff in it, it's really tough. But it's really good, I'm sure it will make sense. And the second one is linear programming. And when I was talking about optimization earlier, that's linear programming is what, what you use to, um, to optimize things. Um, and I couldn't talk about it, but I did. And it's quite interesting. You'll see, yeah, well, those of you who do further maths will see it in D1 when you do it, because it's in D1. But there'll be chapter in Right, so I'm going to move on now to the second application. Uh, price elasticity of demand, supply, cost elasticity. Um, I won't talk about them much because they're much of a muchness. Um, but the, this is a very good application of maths three times. And like I say on my PowerPoint, the maths will step up a bit now. Um, and really, the maths in the third application of consumer surplus will make more sense to the year 11s than this one will. So don't give up if you don't get all of this. So we've got price elasticity of demand. So I've defined it in words there. It's how much really, how much quantity of demand changes when price changes. It's looking at responsiveness to a change in price. Um, so we talk about elastic of being one where an increase in price leads to a more than proportionate change in demand. So really that's goods that aren't necessities. So um, I don't know, maybe a Ferrari car. But if you look at a good like bread, which says to be an elastic or any necessity, a big change in price, a really big change in price is still only going to lead to a smaller in that proportion of change in constant demand because people still need it. They're still going to demand it even if the price rises. Of course, the constant demand it is likely to go down, but not as much of a greater extent as before. And the math symbol we give it is a squirrely N. I'm not very good at drawing it. And I don't know why a squiggly N, um, but it's the one you use. And so um, when we, you should know this from your GCC that, um, like I said earlier, PED is always negative. Um, for normal demand, i.e. if the law of demand holds, so it's a normal good. And that's because obviously if, if um, when you look at the equation which we're going to derive, when you've got constant demand on the top and price on the bottom, if one goes up, the other's going to go down. So when you've got a fraction with a positive and a negative, or a negative positive, you're going to get a negative. So PED is, is um, for a normal good, it's always negative. And the numbers you should know is that when it's in between minus infinity and minus one, it's said to be elastic. Uh, elastic. When it's between minus one and naught, it's inelastic. And when it's equal to one, it's what's called unit elastic. And unit elasticity is when a change in price leads to exactly the same proportionate change in demand and quantity demanded. So, you sh in GCSE, you're taught that n equals, um, and we get percentage change, delta being the sign for change, in QD <coughs> divided by the percentage change in price. And that is helpful, yeah, it's helpful for us. But it's not really the best we can do. We can look at this. Now, I always remember Mr. Carney telling us that the percentage change in something was equal to change divided by original times 100. So I've got a, a demand curve. I'm going to start by, I'm just going to quickly derive a better expression, which will make sense to those of you mathematically in here, for price elasticity of demand. So let's consider a point on the demand curve, which has price P and quantity Q. And then we're going to move from this point to another point here, which is going to be P plus DP. And you'll see why I'm using DP 
should be delta p for those of you who are good enough mathematicians to understand calculus. Uh, you use the triangle, and then when it gets to the infinity, say that word, when it gets to infinity, you change it to they will tend to zero, and you get d's. So you know when you look at that, you're frowning. So I don't think you'll get this. You no, get, no, 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 I so. You get from that to dy by dx. So, but I'm going to use dp here so I don't confuse you too much. Um, and this is q plus delta q, uh, d, dq. And the thing you're probably wondering is, why have I got plus here? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to Yeah. And I, I, I should have explained that before I explained other stuff. This one makes sense, we've got q plus dq, and dq is a little bit. So we've moved from q to q plus a little bit. Um, but here, and so it makes sense to add, because we're, we're increasing, we're adding on something. This one, so obviously dp is negative. We're adding on something that's negative. But obviously you might ask, well, why don't I put p minus dp? And the reason is because even if it's negative, it's still, plus still works, and it's going to help us in the maths. So we just use a plus. It's not going to make the maths too confusing. So if we're looking at change over original times 100, n equals, let's draw a big fraction here. The change, so we're looking at this one here now. The change in qd is we're moving from q to q plus dq. So the change is just this dq bit. So we've got change being dq, which I've moved away, um, divided by q. I should have used, I've mixed up capitals here, sorry. dq divided by q times 100. See that holds from here? That is the change. That's the amount when we move from here. That is the original point. This is our original point here. And likewise with price, we're going to do exactly the same. Change in price is p plus dp <coughs> minus p, which is dp. The original price is p, so we've gone down here, times 100. Now we can completely scrub off these 100, 100, because we're trying to top and bottom by 100 of a fraction. So we're going to do the same to both, so we can just get rid of them. Um, now what we can do with fractions is we can times, if we times by, say, q over q here, we times it by 1. Because that's 2 divided by 2 is 1. Any numbers, when you times top and bottom by the same thing, you can still do it. Because when you times something by 1, nothing happens. And now what happens is this q goes here. Uh, I hope I'm not confusing the younger ones here too much. I haven't done much rearranging. Um, I've used another case q again, sorry. Um, and a lot, and on what we're going to do as well, so on the bottom, we get dp times q divided by p. And again, we're going to do exactly the same with p times top and bottom by p as well. So the p goes here, because we've got p over p, so we can cancel them. And on the top, we've got dq times p. And if we rearrange this, just writing it exactly the same, we've got n equals p over q dq by dp. where q, dq by dp is the derivative of the function. So say, Matt Brady, here's your chance. We've got q equals 27 minus 3p. What does dq by dp equal? Minus 3. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> Those of you who, haven't, who are still in year 11 won't know why. Um, actually, you will. If you've got a function, and you're trying to find the gradient of it, you know y equals mx plus c. n is the gradient, and the gradient of this line is minus 3. And that's all we're saying here. The key by dp is just the gradient. So what we can say is for our example here, I'm going to scrub some stuff off because it's getting a bit messy. Um, I hope you're finished with all of that and you're on, you get it all. Um, or if you don't, don't worry. So for our example here, n is going to equal minus 3 times p over q because n equals p over q times dq by dp, and we found dq by dp, so we just times by it. Uh, what's the time? I'm doing oh, okay, fine. Um, now what we're going to look at is a case where we consider a point, we're going to look at a few numbers now, we're just going to bung a few numbers in and see what happens. So we've got this point, we found a point earlier, I can't remember, I used p as t. So let's say now p equals 2. So q is going to equal 27 minus 6, 21. 
Uh, yeah. So if we bung this in here, we get that the price elasticity of demand is equal to minus 3 times by p equals 2 <coughs> divided by 21. Oh, <coughs> getting lost here. So we can cancel out 3 here and we can get rid of that 3. So we get that price elasticity of demand equals minus 2 over 7. Now what we know about minus 2 over 7 is that it's between 0 and, it's between 0 and minus 1. So we can say that at this point, this point here, I want to really stress this point because you know when I said earlier that it helps maths and economics help us to understand things. This is the main example to me where the maths behind the economics helped me understand it. So we have a point here, this is our point, 2 and 21, I've drawn it terribly. Um, not to worry though. At, at this point we found uh, the price versus demand to be inelastic. And Mr Carney, bless him, he wasn't a great teacher, and I don't know how we could have explained this to you otherwise, said that price elasticity of demand varies at a point along the demand curve. Now I never understood that. I'll admit I never ever understood how that could be the case. I understood I thought price elasticity of demand was whether it was like this, or whether it was like this, or whether it was like that, or whether it was like that. But now through the maths from what I've learned, I completely understand how price elasticity of demand varies along the demand curve. Let's look at another point. Um, I need to get to a point smaller, don't I? So let's look at p equals 1. I hope this is going to work. Um, let's take now p equals 1, q equals 27 minus 3, 24. So m again equals minus 3 times 1 divided by 24. Have I done this wrong? Uh oh, this is never good. Um, yeah, let's, what I need to do is I need to increase the price more thing because I've drawn this so badly. Excuse me, let's take another point. Um, sorry about that. P equals 7, there we go. P equals 7, Q equals 27 minus 21, 6. Um, and N, I'm sorry I used, I wasn't thinking straight. Uh, minus 3 times 7, because we'll go back to our formula. Uh, n equals p over q, so you've got n equals this one, minus 3, there's the minus 3, times by uh, p is 7, divided by 6. That's going to cancel with that to give 2, get rid of the 3. So we've got now equals minus 7 over 2, which is between minus 1 and infinity. So we've got a point, um, <coughs> I've drawn it so badly. Um, I hope you're still all understanding. Uh, 21. And this point is 7, 6. <coughs> 6. And this point is elastic. We can get rid of that now. Because it's inelastic, because what we said here is that it's, inelast it's elastic if n is between minus 1 and infinity. And we've shown that it equals minus 3.5. And you should know that that is not between 0 and 1. It's between minus 1 and infinity. So this point's elastic. And this point uh, down here is inelastic. And I'm just going to write the values on it. That's funny, I've used 2 over 7 and 7 over 10. Um, so now... 7. Which one is minus 2 over 3? Which one would be unit elastic? Go on. That's right. So it's minus 2 over 7. Where's the minus 2 come from? Sorry. I knew it would be my handwriting that would bring it down because it's something neat. Um, I made that up. I, I was going to say Q equals uh, no, a D minus E P, and you can derive a general result. Yeah, I just made it an example. Yeah, so it would have got too confusing if I didn't. So, 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 a question on proper result, you'd be giving the equation of the line. The thing is, is that. What's that saying? Yeah. And I thought my laptop was on. <coughs> if it's not, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I'm doing it's not charging. Yeah, yeah. No? Why isn't it charging? I've got to plug in. Will you plug it up or not? Oh, oh yeah, okay. You might have a switch somewhere. Yeah, there's like a safety trip thing. Maybe you turn the reaction. I'm not sure. It's a red light sign. It should be charging. It should be. Try the plug down below. Where is it? I'm trying to do it. Those are not good. It's alright, we can have a bit of a break now, so I've done most of the hard math. Yeah, that's fine. Oh yeah, that's all. Excellent. That's a bit of a problem. Oh, yeah. I don't know what we're doing. That's a duration. <laughs> it's alright for you, Kingsley, it's not alright for you, 11. No, that's what I'm just saying, yeah.
Okay. Okay. Sorry.